When you were in fourth grade, what were you doing? You probably weren't developing the foundation of an organization that is making a global impact. That's an achievement very few people can boast. But Felix Finkbeiner is one of those people. Felix is the founder of Plant for the Planet, and on this episode of IT Visionaries, he explains his mission, how technology is helping to connect organizations all over the world, and he talks about the One Trillion Trees Project, which through working in partnership with companies like Salesforce, is something he is hoping can positively impact the planet in huge ways. Enjoy this episode. This episode of IT Visionaries is part of a special series on sustainability. IT Visionaries is brought to you by the Salesforce Customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Take climate action with a pre-built carbon accounting solution and gain insights into your greenhouse gas emissions. Learn more at salesforce.com slash solutions slash sustainability. Welcome to another episode of IT Visionaries. I'm Ian Faison, host of IT Visionaries, and we have special guest, Felix, what's going on? Hi, it's lovely to meet you. Great to meet you as well. Um, we have an extra different sort of episode for our listeners today as part of our sustainability series where we've been working with um, a bunch of key folks in the Salesforce ecosystem and talking about what the importance of sustainability. Um, we wanted to have you on, Felix, to talk about some of the amazing things that you're doing and your journey and how technology plays a role in the important work you've done so far and the work you're going to do. So let's get into it. Tell us a little bit about your organization. It's about 13 years ago. I was uh, nine years old. I was in fourth grade and I was supposed to give a little presentation in my class about the climate crisis. And when I prepared that presentation, I found out about a woman from Kenya called Bangari Matai, who had uh, planted 30 million trees in 30 years with uh, lots of women across Kenya and some other East African countries. And she essentially used tree planting as a tool for women's empowerment. Um, it's incredibly inspirational. And she won the Nobel Peace Prize for her, for her work. I didn't really understand the depth of her great work back then, but I did understand that how planting trees helps us fight the climate crisis. And this is why back then I recommended or suggested to my classmates that we should be planting trees, that we should plant one million trees in each country of the world. And my classmates liked the idea. And this is why um, a few weeks later, my uh, fellow uh, you know, fourth graders and I went outside and planted our first tree. And we were actually just really lucky back then because two local journalists reported about this. And this is how some other schools found out about our idea and uh, joined us by planting some trees as well. And then a, a slightly older student, I think he was you know, in 10th, 11th grade at the time, created a very simple website for us. Um, which was essentially just a ranking among local schools of who had planted the most trees. And this is really when, when Plant for the Planet kicked off, um, because lots of students essentially wanted to outcompete their, their rival school, their neighboring school. And, you know, after one year, we had planted about 50,000 trees. Uh, after three years, our first million, and then children and youth all across the world started joining us. Today, we've got over 80,000 children that have been trained as part of our Plant for the Planet academies in, in 73 countries. And of course, many of them establish um, local clubs in their communities where they work with their, their, their friends to plant trees and um, teach people about the importance of, of tackling the climate crisis. And uh, we've also got a bigger project that we can um, chat more about in, uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula in southern Mexico where we currently have a team of about 100 employees planting on average one tree every 15 seconds. So last year, that was about two and a half million trees. This year, we're aiming for three and a half million trees planted. That's incredible. What was the, the urge there for you to kind of turn this into an organization? You know, it seemed like you weren't, you weren't content uh, with just doing it with your classroom and the folks around you. Yes and no. Like in retrospect, it, it seems like, or, you know, so it, it sometimes seems like it was in, inevitable that it was going to go there or that way. But like, we certainly did not plan this uh, in, in any way. We were just a couple of kids 
planting trees. It just then, you know, um, grew at an incredible, incredible pace because we were really lucky. Um, and I guess because that message um, happened to catch on really well. And then we just uh, rode that wave of success. But it, it, it grew to a scale um, where uh, we then needed to, you know, professionalize it a little bit. And we had some fantastic help, um, not just from my teacher back then, but also from uh, a group of parents of many of our ambassadors that then helped us turn this, you know, movement into an organization. So um, we had our first employee at Plant for the Planet about a year after we started, and we turned into a, a foundation about uh, three years after we started. And, you know, uh, it's obviously grown since then. And so as you were building Plant for the Planet, what were some of the early challenges of trying to figure out how you could have an impact? At the beginning, it, it all, um, you know, seemed rather easy. We got, had lots of, you know, activists um, doing their work uh, by planting trees. I feel like the, the, our biggest uh, challenge then emerged in, in 2011. So this was about three years after we started with our work. And this is when um, the UN handed over the billion tree campaign to, um, to us at Plants the Planet. And a bit of backstory here, I think, is, is important. Um, I mentioned earlier Vangari Matai, who ha- had started this wonderful movement of planting 30 million trees. And after this, she had partnered up with the UN Environment Program to start the Billion Tree Campaign, to convince the world to plant the billion trees. And this campaign was uh, incredibly successful. Um, ended up planting not just a billion, but over, tw- uh, over 13 billion trees um, by now. But in 2011, Vangari Matai uh, passed away. And this is why the UN asked us to continue leading this campaign that uh, she had started. So obviously, the goal of a billion trees had been reached. So we started asking ourselves, what should the next uh, goal be? And um, because of that, we just asked a couple of ecologists and a couple of climate scientists because we really had like two big questions. The first one was how many trees even exist uh, globally? And the second one was how many additional trees could we plant? But we soon realized that these questions were a lot harder to answer than we thought. And none of these scientists had any clear answers for us until we found a team of three excellent scientists at Yale University that then kicked off a three-year research project for us. At the end of this project, they discovered that there are around three trillion trees globally. um, And that research was then also published in Nature. And so what they found out is that we currently have about three trillion trees, but we used to have about six trillion trees. So before humans started cutting down um, trees around the world, we had twice as many trees as um, we have today. That was the pessimistic part of their findings. And in a later study, they found out that globally we have a space for uh, um, one trillion additional trees. So unfortunately, we can't come, uh, go back to those six trillion trees very simply because we need land for agriculture, for settlements, and so on. Um, but there is a huge amount of degraded forest land around the world that can be reforested. So we could um, increase our, uh, the global forest from three to four trillion trees. And if we manage to plant these trillion trees, it would capture about a quarter of human-made carbon emissions every year. So it would be, have a huge, uh, huge impact. And if we look at the incredibly slow pace at which we're reducing carbon emissions around the world, it becomes very clear that only through massive reforestation, by using these trees to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, is it even possible to limit global temperature rise to the two-degree limit. So um, long story short, um, this research that took quite a long time was then um, the foundation for us to uh, change our goal from, from the billion trees to the trillion trees globally. And this is what, uh, why we launched a trillion tree campaign. It's an incredible situation to see, you know, the numbers, or I guess I should say staggering to see the numbers of like, you know, what things were like. And I think that one of the things that's so empowering about this is that just because it happened a certain way, it doesn't mean that it can't be reversed. And it doesn't mean that it can't be reversed in a quicker time than it was previously. And now that we know 
the information, now that we have the data on these sort of things, I mean, how do you look at the problem? I mean, obviously this is a technology podcast for technology leaders. Like how do you infuse like data into this whole problem set? Because it seems like just all of the obvious things, where do you plant the trees? How many do you plant in certain locations? What is the mechanism in which you can do that? It seems like you've kind of started to figure out this, you know, how to empower people with this. But uh, I'd imagine that there's, uh, there's a technology aspect to this that is is going to be critical going forward. Yeah, absolutely. So we've been calling for these trillion trees to be planted since 2011, but you know, we were crazy kids. So nobody really um, cared that much about what we had to say, but a, a range of great papers were published in the last few years that really um, supported um, this go goal, our mission, including one great high profile paper published by that same team of scientists I mentioned um, in, in July. And this really meant that a lot of uh, prominent people jumped onto this, uh, this, this bandwagon, also now calling for um, this goal of the trillion trees, in including Tom Steyer, one of those presidential candidates um, in the early process of the Democratic primary, but also uh, Mike Benioff, um, Al Gore, and a big group of other people, including also the current U.S. president has, that has signed on um, to this vision. And this now means that this obscure idea of now became uh, sort of mainstream. So now we're really at a point that we need to implement this. And it's obviously a huge, huge goal. Planting a trillion trees means restoring about 10% of the world's surface area to their um, natural um, ecosystems, to, to forests. That's a tremendous effort. And while there are a lot of great um, tree planting organizations already out there in the world that we can build on to kickstart this process. There are a few challenges there. First of all, most of them tend to be really small, so they need to be scaled up massively to have a, a substantial impact. And not that there is excitement around this, um, this goal, there's obviously some interest by a lot of um, organizations to fund these tree planting organizations. But of course, all these people who want to do that funding really struggle with the lack of transparency around these organizations. For instance, a great example, there's a great organization called Say Trees in, in Bangalore, in India, and they do absolutely wonderful work. But of course, nobody outside of Bangalore knows about them. And if you um, wanted to support them, not only wouldn't you know about them, but you couldn't verify that they, uh, the quality of their work. And so what we've been trying to do for the past two years is build an app that solves these, uh, this problem for you, essentially. So this app, um, we actually launched it a couple of months ago with the help of Salesforce, is now um, available in, in the App Store, both for iPhones and Android phones. And essentially what you can do is you can find great tree planting organizations all around the world. Oh, cool. And we, for each of these projects, we are providing um, all this information that allows you to evaluate this project. You'll see the survival rate of these, of the trees they plant, what species they plant, where exactly they plant the, the trees, um, and what each individual tree costs. And the coolest feature, which is um, going to become available in a few months, allows you to see up-to-date and historical satellite images of this project. So you can see what their um, restoration, their tree planting site looks like right now, and it would have looked like a month ago, three months ago, five months ago, uh, many years ago. And this allows you to use these satellite images to see how these trees are emerging. And this, of course, it builds trust that this organization I'm supporting actually does high quality work. Um, that this, the money you're sending there actually leads to trees uh, being planted. And of course, another challenge isn't just uh, the, the transparency and building this trust, but also you want to fund this organization, but they tend to only have an Indian bank account and donating to them uh, means that your donations won't be tax deductible if you send them uh, from the U.S. So we're solving this as well. People can donate directly to, uh, through the app to these organizations. And what's really important here, we're not trying to make any money with this, with this app. 100% of the money goes directly to this organization. We don't take any of the money. They don't have to pay us any commission whatsoever. 100% goes directly to them, minus, of course, the, the credit card fees. And we're also providing this tax deductibility to these organizations in the range of the important donor countries around the world. 
So we're essentially trying to provide this technology to make the supporting of tree planting as frictionless as possible. Have you found that, I mean, you work with a bunch of different kind of corporate partners, and obviously we have a lot of corporations or leaders of of corporations on this, as listeners on this podcast, but have you seen, you know, from your partners, like how much impact can an organization have? Like how, how much can they rally around a cause like this if they're interested? I think... Mark Benioff has really pr- proven how, uh, you know, as a corporate leader, you can it really bring such an idea um, to uh, and give it a global platform. Um, he is in big part the reason why so much attention um, has come to this mission of planting um, a trillion trees. And this is, of course, a big project that needs a lot of funding. And this funding simply isn't coming from from governments. It's not coming from international organizations. The only realistic way to fund tree planting at this this large scale is by getting companies to get on board and uh, making this part of their mission to fund large-scale reforestation to tackle the climate crisis. So we've got actually hundreds of companies that have supported us in the past and made our tree planting um, around the world uh, possible. So it's absolutely crucial for companies to get on board. And we're actually calling on all companies to voluntarily making themselves carbon neutral. That means that, uh, you know, if you run a company, um, you, you calculate the carbon emissions that um, your company produces. And then, of course, you do your best to reduce these emissions as much as possible. But of course, most companies won't be able to get to zero emissions uh, by next year. So in the meantime, While you're trying to reduce your carbon emissions, you you can compensate all those carbon emissions that you do do produce um, by planting trees, for instance. You know, it's funny. It's it's such a technological age and so many problems we can leverage technology to support, to enhance, to track, to leverage data, to find a lot of things to have a bigger impact. Tree planting feels like one of those things that obviously technology can help in a ton of ways, but it can't plant the trees, right? There, there has to be people at the end of the day that are, that are doing that. Well, I guess in theory, robots too. But um, for the sake of this, we'll talk about the people aspect. What have you seen in terms of the engagement of the, of the people that have been motivated to do this? You said that like, you know, there was some, uh, some healthy competition amongst the, the school children. You talked about, you know, the women in Africa that, that were empowered by this. I'm curious, like, what's the, what's the effect from a human perspective on being involved in this type of cause? So I want to actually, um, before I answer your question properly, um, quickly speak about this technology aspect in in tree planting because there was a lot of interest in the last few years as interest in tree planting in general increased in trying to find ways to for instance plant trees with uh with drones and other technological um solutions but so far all of these approaches have failed no one's actually managed to in any way truly improve upon the tree planting uh, process with with modern technology. So the vast majority of trees that are planted around the world are literally planted by people with a, with a shovel digging a hole, putting the seedling in there. So you know, from a technologist perspective, that might not sound particularly advanced. But on the other hand, I don't actually think that that's a bad thing, because what's really important is that the vast majority of reforestation potential, so essentially areas that can be turned into forest again, actually exist in countries of the global south. They uh, they exist in countries with um, high levels of unemployment, where we should invest a lot of money and create a lot of jobs anyway. These are, you know, African countries, Latin American countries, and Southeast Asian countries. So the fact that these are very labor intensive um, processes that need a lot of local people to support and make this happen. Means that by investing large sums of money into tree planting, we are also um, creating a huge benefit to these local economies by bringing lots and lots of of jobs to countries of the global south. So a reforestation can have a fantastic impact on these economies through the jobs that are created directly in the tree planting process, but of course also through the resources that are created 
as a result of tree planting. Right, uh, wood can be a fantastic resource, and if it's uh, harvested at a limited scale, you don't actually clear cut the forest entirely, of course, but only harvest selectively. This can actually um, work while still capturing as much carbon as possible. So um, tree planting is truly fantastic in that way. But of course, a lot of those tree plantings we support are also planted by volunteers. And I think people have a lot of fun coming together for a day uh, with a big group of like-minded people and spending that day planting trees. Yeah, that's so interesting. So when you see people that are you know, kind of like being engaged as, as a, as a part-time volunteer or people that are, you know, like planting on, on like a given, you know, given day, what's your message to those people after they just spent, you know, uh, you know, handful hours planting trees, like, because I'd imagine that it's super helpful that they did that, but really at the end of the day, you know, you need to build a machine that is, doing this, you know, all day, every day in order to meet this one trillion trees objective, right? Like, I'd imagine that, you know, as helpful as it is to have volunteers, there's other ways that they can contribute beyond that. That's just seeing the scope of the problem in that kind of one day, if you know what I mean. And that it takes, like you said, dedicated resources and people that are working on this, you know, like around the clock. So like, what do you, how do you like engage with, with a group of people um, or executives that you've done some sort of offsite or something like this where where they've seen like a little taste of what can be done but are asking for what is the next way that they can contribute yeah i fully agree um with with the premise of your question there it's absolutely true um i do want to emphasize though that you know every tree we plant captures on average 10 kilos of co2 a year so every tree is an incredibly valuable contribution. I think the incredible beauty of, of planting trees and this uh, mission we have here is that it's so easy to quantify your impact. You know, it's, it's much, much easier than with a lot of other activism uh, um, projects because it's really wonderful the way we can, we can quantify what we have achieved and see what we have achieved and see what we have achieved from space, which I think is incredibly wonderful. But you're absolutely right. This volunteer tree planting is great, but to scale this up, we obviously need a vast amount of people um, doing this professionally. And I think what will surprise a lot of your, your audience is how cheap tree planting really has become when it's done professionally. So we've got a, um, our great team in Mexico uh, planting trees, and we've now achieved the cost of uh, pretty much exactly one euro per tree that we plant and then also care for, right? It's not just the actual planting. Over half of the work um, happens after planting day in taking care of these trees to ensure that these trees survive. And this entire process from growing it in the nursery to planting it and then um, ensuring its survival costs us one euro uh, per tree. This scaled up to a global level to a trillion um, trees has would have a cost of about half of the stimulus that was just passed by the, the U.S. government to, to tackle the economic uh, challenges resulting from the uh, corona crisis. Just as a sense of scale, it's absolutely doable. And of course, um, you know, it's going to be more expensive in some areas and cheaper in other areas. But what's also really important is that not every each one of these trillion trees actually needs to be planted. Because in a lot of regions, you can achieve new trees through natural um, regeneration. This sim it simply means that trees grow by themselves, right? In some areas, when there are still, there's still a sufficient seed bank in these degraded forests, simply allowing this um, area to recover naturally can do just as much good as planting trees there. So that is, of course, even cheaper than tree planting. Yeah, I mean it's it that's how you achieve the uh the cascading effect of of your efforts there. I'm curious what are the types of trees that you're planting? Um do you, like do you have a a favorite I mean, you know, I'm partial to redwoods here in our in our sunny uh uh coastal bay area weather, but uh I remember planting redwoods in my backyard when I when we were uh, when we were kids that are now like over 30 feet tall. But I'm curious, like what, how do you look at, you know, different trees for ecosystems and all of that? That's wonderful. Um, so what's most important is two things. First of all, that you, that one always plants local species. 
and um, plant a diverse range of different species, right? We will, we will never plant a monoculture, but as many um, different species as possible. Because of course, a big part of our mission is also to, to protect um, and enhance the local uh, biodiversity. And that is best done by, uh, by, by planting all these different types of species. So if you were to set up um, a big restoration project in an area where a lot of the, uh, the, the forest was destroyed, what you would first do is you find a nearby intact forest that hasn't yet been damaged. And you analyze this forest by looking at which species exist there. And then you try to mimic this forest as well as um, possible in this forest that you are recreating. That makes sense. A lot of people do wonder whether there are specific um, tree species that, for instance, capture the most amount of carbon, but that's that's not the case. Of course, um, very simply, the, the amount of CO2, amount of carbon a tree captures is directly proportional to how fast it grows. And of course, some trees grow a little faster, but then might not grow quite as, as big in general. So, you know, there, there are these slight uh, minor trade-offs, but at the end of the day, it's generally um, diverse forests that capture the most carbon. Um, and that is actually due to a very simple process. If you plant a monoculture, all the species that you plant all the trees that you plant will need exactly the same resources. So they're directly in competition with one another. But if you plant lots of different trees uh, next to one another, all of them you know, need slightly different resources, have slightly different strategies um, of gaining these resources. And because of that, um, they often end up capturing way more biomass and therefore way more carbon on the same unit area. So do you plant the trees as a, like as a seedling, like what goes into the ground? Cause I would imagine that that's a significant logistics challenge in order to have, you know, staging areas where you're bringing these and growing these seedlings and then getting them to the areas that you would plant. That's true. Those are obviously big uh, logistical challenges. Um, but in general, in most areas around the world, the most cost effective strategy to um, restore forests um, is by planting seedlings that are often somewhere between six months and two years old. So they'll, they'll be about um, a foot in length. Of course, it is possible to plant trees essentially by dispersing seeds. Uh, but of course, these seeds tend to have very, very, very low survival rates. Um, obviously, it's, it's, it's way cheaper at the same time. So it balances out a little bit, but in general, uh, planting seedlings is the most effective way. You mentioned building an app earlier. I'm curious, like I, I you know, clearly you didn't get into uh, solving this problem and building Plant for the Planet. Which, by the way, if everyone you can just Google Plant for the Planet or um, Plant Dash Four Dash the Dash Planet dot org, and we'll link it up in the show notes here. You didn't get into this for you know, the building a tech stack, but clearly every, you know, every organization in the future is, is, has to rely on technology to, you know, enhance their mission, to enhance what they're doing, to create opportunities, to scale and track what's going on. Were there challenges that went into just, you know, building an app? I'm, I'm curious, I'd imagine it's not your, your forte to, uh, to build apps. Oh yeah, it was a big challenge for us. Very simply, because um, yeah, none of our team members were technologists. We were all, you know, activists, um, ecologists, you know, tree planters. So building the expertise, finally, right people to add to our team uh, to get this started, uh, to build this app, was a big challenge. So we we kicked this off about two and a half years ago and made some very, very slow progress at the beginning, but we've learned a lot since then. And I think we now have a, a pretty excellent team, and uh, especially bec uh, because of the excellent support we get from, from Salesforce. You know, we've become a lot better and our improvements to the app are accelerating a lot. And I'm, I'm quite proud by, uh, of what we've now achieved in that space. Yeah. I mean, it's just funny to think that, you know, in today's day and age that it's like, you know, do we really need an app? Does everyone need an app? But it is once you see the results of it and people, like you said, part of the part of the problem is trust and transparency. And when you're looking at, you know, specifically with the nonprofit community, you know, it is necessary. Like we need to know what is happening and we need to know, you know, where 
dollars are going and it's both sides, right? Like if you're running a nonprofit, absolutely you need to know where all of that stuff is going because you need to, you know, solve operational challenges. And I think for a lot of our listeners that, you know, run technology for large organizations, that's a requirement for them. That's their job every day is to to layer in technology to make their employees more productive, to make sure their product is more productive, their you know lines of logistics is, is optimized. And if we want our nonprofits to work better, like we need to do something to support those. And so it's cool to see Salesforce step up. Obviously, they're the sponsor of this podcast, and we love them too. But um, it's just cool to see that the direct impact that an organization can have onto a nonprofit just by helping with the technology piece. I absolutely agree. Thank you. Yeah. Do you, so do you, um, what's next? Like what, what's on the horizon? I mean, we got, we got a lot of trees to go. Um, <laughs> what, what, I mean, we have billions more to, to plan here, but uh, how big is the organization now and, uh, and, and what's next? Yeah, you're absolutely right. We've got a huge mission ahead of us. Those trillion trees, around 13 billion trees have been planted. In total, that gives us about 1.3% of what we need to achieve. So we've got a huge way uh, still ahead of us. Um, We've got a team of about uh, 150 people in total working at Plant for the Planet, of which 100 are planting trees all day and 50 working on all all our other work across uh, across the globe. But I think we are like at a very pivotal point in our history because so far a huge part of our work was trying to get that message out there um, of the importance of the trillion trees. And that has been, because of the help of uh, a lot of great people around around the world, uh, more successful than I guess we could have hoped. So our work really changes now from trying to get that message out there and convincing the world about the importance of restoring forests to actually implementing that work and building great tools that allow people that are excited about this to actually help implementing this. And that means making it as easy as possible for any private individual to essentially donate uh, to tree planting, to make it as easy as possible for companies to compensate their emissions by, you know, planting trees and making it part of their corporate social responsibility and simply building out that infrastructure that we are actually able to plant trees are these large scales. Not just by, you know, building up our own teams around the world, planting trees, but I think the most effective thing we can do, and that's what we're working on right now, is essentially helping other organizations around the world that are already planting in their countries to simply scale up their work. That's what we're trying to achieve. And so can you just, you know, before we, uh, before we let you go here, you have a lot of work to do. I'm curious, like, can you just share maybe some examples of how organizations have, have been able to support and create a partnership with you all that uh, is enduring? So yes, the, the, the most important aspect of this is that um, through this app, a huge variety of organizations, we've got um, now close to 100 around the world, upload the exact polygons, the exact outlines of where they work into, into our app. And they now have very simple um, recording tools so that the people actually planting those trees in the field can then register the trees they planted that day through the, through the phone they, um, they, they carry with them, which um, gives the organization itself um, that does this tree planting work a much uh, more accurate record of the the work they're doing for their own purposes, but then also immediately makes that available to essentially all their donors and to the entire community around the world um, and immediately brings that transparency out there. A lot of these organizations, you know, they want the, this transparency to, to build that trust, but simply that, that set of tools has never been built for them because, you know, so far that's been a very niche space. Not that many people have been trying to um, reforce around the world. So, um, but that's, that's changing now with a lot more excitement uh, coming for tree planting. Incredible stuff. That's really cool to see that happening uh, in real time. What a difference that that can make in, uh, in the way that partners can engage and, uh, and share those results. That's really cool. Felix, we're really excited to follow along with your work. Um, where can people find you? Where can they find the organization? Obviously everybody just, uh, you know, it's easy, go get your organization involved and, uh, and at least give some money and you'll be able to, to track your, your trees here in, in real time. Where can people find you? Just search for, for Plant for the Planet um, wherever you want to find us and you know download the app and give us feedback. I'm sure there's lots of uh, ways we can improve upon what we've built and we'd love to hear from you. 
Well, cool. Felix, thanks so much for coming on. Any uh, Anything else? Any final thoughts? No. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Take care. Have a great day. Bye. IT Visionaries is brought to you by the Salesforce Customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Take climate action with a pre-built carbon accounting solution and gain insights into your greenhouse gas emissions. Learn more at salesforce.com slash solutions slash sustainability.